Um, but let's stay with this story as well about the countryside and what is happening to the countryside and why it's being called racist. I'm not kidding you. Ethnic minorities face discrimination in the countryside, according to a rural charity, said that following a row over a country file segment about BAME access, the CPRE, the countryside charity, defended the BBC show after presenter Dwayne Field said, when I talk to people from the BAME community, it's clear they don't view the UK countryside as somewhere that's for them. Uh, the piece had quoted DEFRA research that said some ethnic groups felt that national parks were a white environment. Uh, the CPRE wrote on Twitter, thought-provoking, challenging, an important segment on Countryfile. It also released a statement saying, we will only achieve a countryside that's rich in nature, accessible to everyone, and play a crucial role in responding to the climate emergency if we end the racial inequalities that exist in engagement with the countryside. So does that mean the countryside is racist? 0344 499 1000. We'll open the lines on that now. Tom Fyans is Policy and Campaigns Director at the CPRE, the Countryside Charity. Tom, afternoon to you here. Um, let's just pick this mm -hmm. one a little part, uh, apart if we can, sir, here. I mean, if somebody puts the question, is the countryside racist? How do we answer that? Well, I think, I mean, Country File have raised a really important issue and we're really pleased that we're starting to have this kind of conversation. Because certainly research over the, at least the last 20 years or so from Natural England and other bodies that point to the fact that there are inequalities in access to the countryside and to the green spaces that we all, we, we all need for our health and well-being. So, you know, BME communities and people are underrepresented. We see, I think, 20% of children from a BME background visiting the countryside as opposed to 40% of white children. And generally, the pattern is that there is less, there is less representation there. And we want to do something about that as CPRE, the countryside charity. We believe in a countryside for all and we really want to address any inequality in access to that to the countryside. Yeah, I mean, you guys do great work and let's just underline that. But you know, I wonder whether, Tom, this is more of a class thing than a colour thing. I think it's both. I think it's, it's a mixture of multifaceted issues. There are socioeconomic issues, barriers, social barriers to people accessing the countryside. There are racial ones. There are practical ones. And, you know, it's, it's a mixture of things, but certainly um, the Glover Review of Landscapes that you mentioned, it did coin this phrase around a predominantly white middle class club. And I think um, I think a lot of people would recognize that they may not like it and they may feel quite offended by that. But actually, I, I think a lot of people would recognize that mm. for a lot of black and ethnic minority communities, it isn't seen as a place that's for them. And that's often in their words, not mine. Is it? Uh, is, is it just a kind of historic legacy thing going on here? You know, the countryside often, you know, in, in terms of those that populate as in live in the countryside, they might well be farmers. They'd be farmers of many generations and therefore they're likely to be just more white people living in that environment, white middle class people yeah. than there would be any other class or any other colour. That's just by definition of history. I mean, statistically, you know, ethnic minorities generally are very low levels in the countryside, certainly in England, compared, compared to white um, people. But, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a multifaceted problem. It does, there are historical issues around that. I mean, I think what, what we're doing at the moment as a society is ask, having conversations around some of the causes of prejudice and, and racial inequality. And, of course, those, those issues apply to the countryside as much as they do urban areas. You know, I don't think we could say that any community is free from discrimination. In terms of where this goes, then, I mean, what, what's your, your, your plan to make the, the countryside or help with a plan to make the countryside a more inviting place for other ethnic groups? Yeah. Well, I think we need to, to be honest, I think we need to listen. We need to start listening a lot more to the voices of those lived experiences of black and ethnic minorities who are who are experiencing a very different countryside to the kind of countryside that you or I perhaps might experience when we visit or live there. We need to share their stories. We need to listen to their perspectives. We need to, certainly as an organization, we're commissioning some new research, participant-led research, working with these communities to really dig deep into the social barriers that exist, mm. what is really going on here, and, and really start to have a conversation about this at a national level around making sure that everyone has the access to the countryside that we all need. Good work, Tom. Thank you. Nice to have you on, sir. Tom Fayens, Policy and Campaigns Director at the CPRE, the Countryside charity i would say this um I, i'm going to stick with the class thing here um if you consider the amount of pe non-white people that were invited 
hear that word, invited to this country, I'm thinking Windrush as an obvious example. Essentially, we invited hundreds of thousands of working class people into this country in the 60s and the 70s. Now, there's going to be a journey involved in that. I'm talking about the class structure here. In the same way that people whose class jumped from working class to middle class also went on that same journey. So my background now, my um, experience now, if somebody said to me, what class are you? I can, I'm a bloke from a working class background and I still have many of those kind of values and that part of you that's in your sort of DNA that never quite goes away. I become a bit defensive about class for that reason. But my life now is absolutely middle class. If I were to say I'm a working class boy, like some chirpy old cockney, I mean, I'd be laughed out the room, frankly. I live in flipping Seven Oaks, for goodness sake. I mean, it doesn't really get any more. I eat brioche for breakfast. My little boy is six. He had couscous for tea. I said it the other day. My, little, my kids have turned out to be the very kids I hated when I was a kid. Thank you, John Bishop, for that line. It just happens to me. It's the way it works, isn't it? I didn't choose that. I just happened to get into a job and in a world where you suddenly find yourself experiencing different things. And, you know, so it moves on. So anyway, in Seven Oaks, there's a place called Knoll Park. It's a huge National Trust park. Absolutely massive. Shed loads of deer lurking around the place. Got a little house there. Um, it's beautiful. And everyone goes there for walks. And I notice a lot non-white people out there walk. Now, there's a massive private school in Seven Oaks called, oddly, Seven Oaks School. Um, that might account for some of that. Uh, but actually, Seven Oaks is quite white, but it's not exclusively white. And But the non-white contingent, which is where I'm going with this, is I, I would suggest is largely professional middle class. And that group of people don't feel any truck of going to Knoll Park no more than their white peers do. Which brings me back to why I sense its class. And so you have professional people who, you know, the, the, the obvious sort of contingent of South Asian professionals, whether they happen to be in archetypal sort of medical roles, that the world of engineering, somebody I know who works uh, originally from India, who works in a very senior position in engineering, his parents were working class, he's moved through, he's now... My point is that journey takes some time. So for me to become, if you like, the first middle class... By the way, it's not a badge of honour. It's just an inevitability. But for me to become the first kind of middle class sort of elephant strand of my family, my sister, for example, she hasn't... Her, her life didn't dictate that that's how things changed in, in terms of the class structure. I'm, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about because nobody wants to be in these pigeonholes, but for basic economic, socioeconomic reasons, we sort of are. So my sister is still in the same kind of background and class and so are most of my family uh, pretty much all of my family I would say so I've, I'm this sort of lone strand that sort of popped out the gene pool and, and moved into a different one by the way I should add it's not a better one it's just a different one it's a far more diverse one as well um, so, so I can kind of see the problem with the countryside, that, that there are groups of people. If you consider Windrush as an obvious example, a couple of hundred thousand working class people come to this country. They're on the same trajectory as me. So you're only just now going to start getting more middle class as a percentage from those groups, as you had always done with the, if you, if you like, the white indigenous people. Is that, you hear where I'm coming from here? I just think there's a journey. There's a just a time frame on these things and things do eventually change.